Imagine if you discovered the person you loved most in the world was paid to lie to you. They'd infiltrated your home, told you they loved you, then left you heartbroken. And their lies hadn't just affected you, but hundreds of others too. They'd fathered children and stolen dead kids' names, and their lies had become one of the biggest scandals in recent British history. It's the summer of 2018, in the south of England, and Sarah's getting ready to go on holiday. She's new to this story. She packs her things and meets her best friend for lunch. They're going away to Italy the next day, but they're already in the holiday mood. Beautiful. It was August, so we'd gone for a lunch outside. They're catching up under the warm midday sun when Sarah's phone rings. It surprises her because she usually puts it on silent when she's with people. And even more random for me, I answered it, which I wouldn't do either. It was a number I didn't recognise. A, a man on the other end of the line checks he's got the right person and then says... I'm from the Home Office and I have a letter for you that I need you to pick up by hand. I was like, OK, so... Sarah thinks it's strange and she asks him to leave it with her landlady. He said, no, no, I've got to give it to you by hand. Where are you? Can you meet me? He said, you're not in any trouble. It's something to do with your past, but you're not in any... It was like something from a movie. So I was on the phone looking at my friend and she was looking at me going, what the hell's going on here? So she arranges to meet him down the road, near a letterbox. And we met literally in a side road down the road from my house and he got out of the car and he handed me the letter. So she opens the letter and scans it, nervous about what it's going to say. Do you have a copy of the letter? It might be good to get you to read a bit from that, if that's OK. Just have the exact words. OK. I'm contacting you because I have reason to believe that you may have been affected by undercover policing, and in particular by the deployment of an officer whose work is under investigation by the inquiry. We understand that you may have had contact with an individual who would have been known to you as James Straven, who was employed as an undercover police officer during the period 1997 to 2002. That last bit jumps out at her. James Straven was an undercover cop. He was also her boyfriend for a year in 1998 when she was 32. She met him through a hunt saboteur group in South London, and he's one of the loves of her life, the person she went to India and France with, a man who plagued her dreams ever since they split. She carries on reading the letter, which is from the undercover policing inquiry, and it goes on to say, I'm very sorry for troubling you with this information, which I understand will be unwelcome and distressing to you. So that was nice. I'm so glad my best friend was there with me at the time. It was really good to have her there, but shocking. I think I burst into tears and he got in the car and drove away and I went home. But I had a pretty violent dream about it the night after I went away. Really confusing dream with James in it and everything. It was, yeah, a horrible dream. I can remember getting up and just writing. I started to write down all the dates. It's like trying to piece it together. Hang on, when did he say that and when did that happen? The anger came then. It's like, how dare they? How fucking dare they? The impact that it's had on all of our lives is unacceptable. I'm Cara McGugan and this is Bed of Lies. Episode 7, Inquiry, Part 1. It's the morning of November 2nd, 2020, and the inquiry into undercover policing's about to begin. So John Mitting puts his suit on and sits at his desk at home. Then over Zoom, he starts listening to the opening statements from the people whose lives have been affected by this scandal. It's been a long time coming for the core participants who are listening in. Finally, it's their chance to be heard. There's a sense of catharsis, even though they're just at the beginning of a long road to the truth. We are about to embark on the first of seven days of opening statements, beginning with Mr Barr, counsel to the inquiry, and then proceeding to the opening statements of many, if not all, of the core participants. The inquiry is looking into half a century of undercover policing by the SDS and MPOIU, starting with that protest against the Vietnam War in 1968. 
It'll assess the work of 139 officers who monitored over a 1,000 political groups, the majority of them left-wing and just a small handful of them far-right. One of the things it will address is the discovery by more than 35 women that they were tricked into relationships with police spies. In fact, Harriet Wistrich, the lawyer for many of these women, says... It seems to be very rare that there's an officer who hasn't had intimate sexual relationships with women. I haven't come across any gay ones yet. <laughs> and there have been one or two female officers, but the vast majority are male officers. Ms Kaufman, now is your opportunity to make uh, the first of two opening statements that you are going to make. And in the event that I get carried away... and Philippa Kaufman is the barrister working with Harriet Wistrich. I'm very grateful if somebody could interrupt me and tell me that it's time for a break. Lizzie met Mike Chitty, who she knew as Mike Blake, in 1984, when she was involved in SLAM. That's the South In 1990, Helen Steele was deceived into a relationship with John Dye. Denise Fuller had an intimate relationship Jessica with Jessica and was only 19 years old. Donna McLean... Had the list of women goes on and on and on. Belinda Harvey, Kate Wilson, Anison, Wendy, Rosa, Lisa, McKenna. Jane was a very close, first really serious relationship. The relationship was extremely close and intense over a five year period. An intense relationship. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions the inquiry seeks to answer are who was affected, why did it happen, and what were the consequences? The inquiry could take another five years or so to publish its findings. That's an awful long time. But we can have a go at answering some of those questions in this last episode of Bed of Lies. But back to Sarah and that Home Office letter. She met her boyfriend, James Straven, through hunt stabbing in the south of England. They were together for a year before he abruptly called things off. It's one of those breakups that's always haunted her, and in some ways the news makes sense, because there always was something odd about James. Yeah, some of the subs called him Posh Sab because he spoke really nicely, and he got nicknamed James Blonde, which 007, which is really annoying now. The guy from the Home Office tells Sarah that James Straven had another cover name too, Kevin Crossland. And that identity was stolen from a dead child who was killed in a plane crash in 1968 alongside his mum and sister. Kevin's half-brothers now suing the Met Police along with three other bereaved families. It's horrifying, actually, to realise what, they, what, what happened. And it took, I would say, it took me probably a year to really make that shift and to, and to understand the effects that it's had on my life. Because I underestimated it. I underestimated the effect it would have. Sarah's developed symptoms of PTSD and she finds everyday tasks can overwhelm her. So the panic is just this rising feeling. It's happened on the tube, it's happened on the train, um, of just not being able to breathe, of panic coming on. That can be really scary, especially on public transport. I'm really restless, I can't settle to anything. I've lost my focus. She's only just coming to terms with the news. There's a process each woman goes through when they discover their ex was a cop. And by now, there's a pattern, with new women finding out every couple of years, the most recent of which was in 2019. You know, over the years, months and years, there'd be more women. You know, there'd be, oh, there's another one, and there's another one. And then we'd meet, you know, other women. And, and invariably, the women were connected to often other people who we knew. Alison's now a support worker for Police Spies Out of Lives, the campaign group all these women are part of. She's often the first port of call when people like Sarah get the news. And she's actually sat in on all of our interviews to make sure no one's reliving the traumatic experiences on their own. There's something I'm curious to know. So, Alison, this is quite weird because we've spent months doing interviews with you in the background. You've listened to hours and hours of recordings with the other women going through all of their stories in what must be quite painstaking detail for them and for you. What's it been like? 
It's been interesting. It's been good. It's been very good hearing hearing everyone's stories. I, I put my headphones in. I'm not sure at what point I'm going to need them. It's been weird because there's so many overlaps. I think you need them pretty early on. And so many similarities between the stories. I can still hear you, so I wonder how... And also, oh, even know. though I've heard every, all of the women's stories before, and some people several times before through different cases and different presentations that we've done, I still hear new things, and I still hear things that make me reflect on my story. Things have been really tough here as well. You know, it doesn't matter how many times I hear them, the stories are shocking every time. She very much wants to be portrayed and see herself and others to see her as a political activist with agency. In telling your story and hearing the other women tell their stories, do you think at all about the idea of any of the officers listening to the podcast? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think I'm quite careful. But there's funny stories, there's really, like, that I would tell privately to friends about certain things that I wouldn't say here because it's like, why should I tell the world? that You know, you, you've got the big picture. You've got to hold on to something of your own memories. Now, you might think that after all this, dozens of women discovering they had relationships with undercover cops, a national scandal, the Met Police giving a public apology and an inquiry getting underway. Well, you might think the police would show some remorse... But you'd be wrong. Since the Met apologised and paid compensation to the first eight women, it settled with a further four. But there are ten women who have waited years for their cases to be concluded, including Lindsay, Jessica and Zara. Was that lip service or what? Because we were all having to fight like Billy Ho and they're making it even harder for us now. So what's that all about? No, perhaps they didn't expect all this lot more to come through, but that public inquiry, we're waiting for an apology. We haven't had one. We're still fighting our cases, not sorted. They're making it more difficult than ever. There seems to be no consideration. You know, sometimes I feel like we're being treated like we're the ones that have done something wrong, actually. And we absolutely have not. We haven't. The inquiry's been working in the background for five years, but it didn't hear any witnesses until November, and it's already cost £30 million. And the bulk of the work it's been doing? Well, it's been dealing with anonymity requests from the Met. A quick word on that, because it's important in this story. Firstly, all our women are anonymous. Their names are pseudonyms. And that's because they don't want any more intrusion in their lives than they've already had. But the police... They say releasing the names and cover names of officers who haven't already been outed by activists will jeopardise their safety and the integrity of operations. The inquiry's given around half of the undercovers anonymity, and one of them is Carlo Neri, the Italian, whose real name's been protected. He fought tooth and nail for the undercover police and inquiry to keep his real name out of the public domain. That's Lindsay, the one who went to Venice with Carlo. He at first said that he was desperately scared of us left-wing extremists. He said people in the group had a propensity for violence. And he says he is scared not only for himself, but his family and anyone he's in contact with if his real identity is revealed. You can imagine that had a fairly negative effect on us as a group of individuals. The people who are targeted want to know the names of these officers so they can understand what happened to them. It was only once they had Mark Kennedy and Mark Jenner's real names, for example, that Lisa and Alison discovered their exes were married with kids. And they want to know why these cops deserve protection. The likelihood of violent retribution for the people that I'm, I know is non you know, it's like, really? I, I mean, the most Mark has to be frightened of is me and my mum shouting at him. I'd be quite scared of your mum. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it, it's ludicrous to think that he's at any risk from us. And the main reason it's important is because there could be more officers who've had relationships and women who don't know. 
It's only because the inquiry published James Straven's cover name that Sarah even discovered her ex was a cop. So I think there are many, many more cases. For Alison, it's a sign the police aren't willing to cooperate. I think it's really being used as a cover-up. I mean, I think, you know, at the heart of this is corruption. That idea of a cover-up isn't entirely unfounded. Lawyer Harriet Wistrich. There was a scandal in that some of the more recent units, the NPIOU, that around the time the inquiry was announced, somebody was busily shredding documents. The Independent Office for Police Conduct found in March 2020 that a secretive squad in the Met had indeed shredded evidence even after it was told to preserve it. What could have been revealed in those files? We may never know. But that brings us to one of our key questions. Why did this happen in the first place? David Tucker from the College of Policing thinks the officers justified their actions to themselves. You know, one way of looking at this is a sort of form of noble cause corruption. They believed they were doing the right things and they thought that the, the ends justified the means. It undermines all of you know, people's confidence in policing and we cannot operate in this country unless we have confidence and consent of the public. But that doesn't really tell us why women in particular became their targets. How did it become an acceptable tactic to trick people into long-term relationships? Is this whole thing, do you think, about sexism on a gross scale? Yeah, I think the sexism is institutional and I think that's what we've uncovered. And it's not just the women who think that. Neil Woods, the former undercover cop, thinks it too. I realise that that kind of misogyny really is, or was, at least then, really part of policing. He's working for the police in the 90s and he's seen this sort of behaviour firsthand. I'll give you an example. One drug squad I was working for, they were all male apart from one female. The female got up out of a chair at the end of this briefing and walked towards the door. And one of the detectives ran over to the chair and sniffed the chair where she'd been sitting, much to the uproarious laughter of all the other men in the room. Now, I, I, I had no idea what to say to this. I was just still with my jaw, in my, my mouth open, like just thinking, what on earth is going on here? You know, looking around, everyone's laughing at this. And eventually she laughed. And I'm thinking, well, just, well, what else does she do? And it's not just sexism at work here, but a certain prejudice against the people they're spying on. Alison remembers something Birkenhead Mark says to her. Very early on, he described the left as a knocking shop. He saw it very much as people were, you know, it's very promiscuous and he could have copped off with whoever he wanted to. And I think that was the stereotype that he bought into and that they all bought into about women on the left. I asked David Tucker outright, the head of crime at the College of Policing, is the police a misogynistic organisation? Yeah, it's not, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's reprehensible behaviour. I think we're all agreed on that. Whether it might create the impression of a misogynistic organisation, I, 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 I can't answer that. I don't know. And he is clear on one thing. It shouldn't have happened. No, that's exactly right. The thing is, it did happen, and it went on for over four decades. Any claim by the police that this was the work of rogue officers, well, that doesn't wash. We've heard Andy Coles' instructions in the Tradecraft Manual, and we know Bob Lambert, one time head of the SDS, fathered a child while undercover. That brings us to our next key question. Who knew about this work? How high up did it go? I'm fairly certain it wouldn't have gone all the way up, but whether there was enough management, intrusion, supervision, I think that's another, that's a question, and I would imagine the undercover policing inquiry will get into that in a big way. I would be surprised if that type of activity was authorised. So there are two ex explanations, it seems to me, is either they knew, which seems pretty extraordinary to me, or they didn't know. I've asked everyone I've interviewed this question, but it's such a secretive world, no one really has the answer. 
Next, I try Neil Woods. Who do you think authorised the whole operations of the SDS and the National Public Order Intelligence Unit? The Home Secretary. There's been a clear link between the SDS and the security services, the MI5. And then, of course, MI5 report to the Home Secretary, as does the commander of the Met. So these things must have been discussed politically. Now, whether that means the Met commander or the Home Secretary knew about the tactics of these units is another thing. We do know the police have needed to get permission from the Home Secretary to bug someone's phone ever since the Leveson inquiry. But does the same go for relationships with a target? Well, that's a question for the undercover policing inquiry. Some of you might be thinking, these political groups need monitoring. They were disruptive, right? A few of them are committing crimes. And the MPOIU was set up in 1999 off the back of the SDS work. So the police must have thought these squads were gathering valuable intelligence, that the threat across the UK was big enough to warrant a second unit. So let's have a look at what they actually achieved. To start with, and we might already know this, their aim was to gather information and live undercover for years, rather than to stop protests from happening. And many of the undercovers did just this and got involved in actions themselves. Now, there are some tangible examples of the intelligence being used. Mark Kennedy's reports from the G8 protests in Scotland in 2005 are said to have made it to the desk of Tony Blair. Meanwhile, we know his reports about the ratcliffe on saw power station plans led to the biggest preemptive arrest in British history. But after he was outed as a cop, the charges against those protesters collapsed and those found guilty were exonerated. That brings us to another of our questions. This is really something about proportionality. Did the activities of all these political groups merit being spied on? And that's one that plays on the minds of the women in our story. Lindsay wasn't even an activist when she went out with Carlo. She did have friends in the Socialist Party, but weren't they just exercising their political right? None of us were like, you know, terrorists, you know what I mean? We weren't doing anything which would warrant this kind of intrusion. David Tucker says the SDS and MPRU had valid aims, but their methods were wrong. These units were set up to prevent these organisations being manipulated by individuals who wanted to act in an illegal way. So I think that the, the intention of setting up the units was, was OK. The implementation of, the, of what was required is where it, where it feels to me like it's gone wrong. But not everyone agrees with him. Neil Woods thinks this sort of work should have never happened. Because police should not be commenting or trying to control what people protest about. Our democracy is built on the right to demonstrate. And that's why this scandal and this series have focused on these two units. After all, it's not the sort of policing you'd expect to happen in Britain. And so with all this out in the open at long last, you'd hope that lessons have been learned and tactics changed. One thing that has happened is these units have disbanded, the SDS in 2008 and the MPORU in 2011. But what about the men that served in them? I'm sure if you were to speak to any of them, they would tell you how terrible it's been for them. They've lost everything. They've got divorced, moved abroad and retired to the countryside. Some of them have been promoted, others charged with gross misconduct. In part two of this episode, we'll hear all that and more. And one of the men will be making an appearance. Hi, I'm Nick Hume, CEO of the Telegraph Media Group. It's fair to say 2020 has been a year like no other. 
Given all the various restrictions around movement, it's been a challenge to cover news, but one that hopefully you recognise we've risen to exceptionally well. The Telegraph remains committed to telling stories that inform, question and scrutinise. Stories like the one you're listening to. And we couldn't shed light on wrongdoing and hold public bodies to account without the support of our subscribers. The choices they make to fund our journalism mean that we can spend time digging into stories like the undercover policing scandal and make podcasts like Bed of Lies. So if you'd like to support what we're doing and to get unlimited access to our huge range of quality journalism on politics, sport, business, culture and more, then head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash lies podcast where you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online and after that it is just a mere £2 a week. So that's telegraph.co.uk forward slash lies podcast or click on the link in the show notes to this episode.